Why do we play these games? It's a question I'm going to ask you a lot tonight. Colin, here's a better end point. Why do we play these games? These college football games, they look so nice and neat on paper. Why do we play them? Well, Michigan 45, Ohio State 23. That's one reason why we play the games, I guess. Buckeyes, about a seven and a half or an eight point favorite going into this game. I was on the field for this. As you can imagine, it was pretty jarring to witness. Pales in comparison to how jarring it was for the Ohio State players. I want to start from the back and then want to work my way to the front. After these games, normally what I'll do is I'll go to a post-game press conference. I actually went to Ryan Day's post-game press conference yesterday. And then we'll go back out on the natural playing surface of the stadium and we'll do some live hits for CBS. So I did that yesterday. Two things I probably will never forget. Number one, how defeated and how stunned uh, Ryan Day was. Handled himself fine post-game. I'm just saying these folks thought they were about to double-digit blow out Michigan. They thought they were going to run all over them. They thought they were going to dictate every term in that football game yesterday. That's not just the fan base. That staff fully believed that. Fully believed it. A lot of folks believed it. The second part, and what I will really remember is when I went back out there, several of those Ohio State players didn't leave the stadium immediately. They went to the locker room, but after the place had cleaned out, you know, we see things you don't see. And one of the things is, man, a lot of those players, especially the ones who were wearing that uniform for the last time, they're back out there. Some of them are just sitting on the field. Uh, some of them are up in the stands just sobbing. It was pretty somber. But that's sports, man. That's competition. And so it's beautiful if you're a Michigan fan. It's gut-wrenching if you're an Ohio State fan. But when this thing started to go the way it did, and I'm going to talk a lot about it, but when it started to go the way it did, I'm sure a lot of people thought a lot of things. But when Michigan started to pull away, especially in the second half, one of the images my mind went back to is when we were down in Miami last year, not in Ann Arbor, not when they beat Ohio State when they had punched their ticket to the playoff and they went to Miami and they lost to Georgia, we were there. I think I talked about this on the show. Colin, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I told you, uh, but I haven't mentioned it since then. After that place kind of cleaned out, a lot of the Michigan fans had already left. It was a blowout game. And then the game's over and they're starting to do the trophy presentation on the field. A lot of the young guys from Michigan, I really noticed this because it was right next to me. They stayed on the field. They didn't say a word. They weren't being demonstrative. They weren't, you know, looking to draw attention to themselves. Quite the opposite. They were kind of standing over in the corner, and they just stood there and watched. Um, J.J. McCarthy was one of them. Donovan Edwards was one of them. Big contributors to yesterday's win. They just stayed there and watched. And I remember looking at that, and I remember thinking to myself, it's a shame a lot of Michigan fans can't see this because they probably love it because what is the nucleus of your future hopes in games like we saw yesterday they kind of they look like they get it here. And there they were, about 11 months later, on the field yesterday, and boy, did they do some special things. How do unbelievable results happen? This is where I want to dive into this whole paper versus real life thing. Because on paper, the reason I have such a problem with a lot of people telling you what they think would happen on a neutral field or who would be favored is not that that's not a proper way to power rate teams, but it's not competition. I do power ratings, but then I freely tell you that's not competition. The beautiful thing about games like this is you know they're coming. Michigan did not have to really argue their point the whole year. If you're a Michigan fan from Flint or, or Sault Ste. Marie, most people from Georgia can't say that properly. Salt St. Marie from my friends in Fortson. You listened the entire year as folks talked about Ohio State being better than you and you got to go to Columbus and they'll be favored and they should win by this many points. But it was never a problem. Why? Because you knew you were going to eventually arrive at that day. And that day was yesterday. And it didn't happen on a piece of paper. It happened on a playing surface. How was Michigan going to pull off the upset? Well, it's quite simple, but it's also a little more nuanced than how simple it is to say. To pull off something impossible, all a team has to do is do things that they haven't done all season. There's a big difference between have not and cannot. And if you watched the Thursday edition of Late Kick, this does not sound foreign to you. Colin, get the sound ready. Three, two, one, roll it. I am looking at Michigan 
And the question I would love to see answered in the definitive for them is, does their passing game show up? i got to be honest with you. Like I've been sky high on them all year. I've been a little disappointed in the development or lack thereof in what I thought was going to be a great receiver room for them this year. But here's the thing, going into a game like this, the guys are still there. Ronnie Bell's still in there. The potential and the reasons I thought that room had potential, they're still there. It just takes one four-quarter game. It just takes two or three explosive plays in a four-quarter game for you to think about the rest of the year and say, who cares? We won the games without them doing it. But boy, when they did it on this Saturday, that's when we needed it the most. So I'm thinking about that. Five of them. Five plays of 45 yards or more. I think four of them of 69 yards or more. That's all it took. That's the difference in the game. You can break it down nine ways from Sunday, and we kind of will in just a second. But that was the long and short of it. Had you seen that all year? Number one, you hadn't seen it from Michigan. You hadn't seen them bomb away. You hadn't seen them take the top off a defense. I would argue Ohio State kind of took their own top off by not having a top. But they played the game that was put in front of them which is really beautiful, and it's also simple. The game that was put in front of them is Ohio State decided we're not letting Blake Corum beat us. Now, what was funny is Blake Corum was in there for about three seconds, and then he's done the rest of the afternoon, and Ohio State still decided they were going to play as if to not let Blake Corum beat him. And so you got McCarthy back there, and you got the Michigan Offensive Brain Trust saying, do we really see what we think we're seeing? Okay. Like, if that's what they're going to give us, we're going to do this as you're watching on B-roll. Just have guys run free in the secondary. Like, it, it, at various points yesterday, looked like Alabama circa Devontae Smith and Jerry Judy. And this is a Michigan passing attack that, as I said, and as many of you Michigan fans had said going into this game, had left a little something to be desired. Well, it was always there. As I said Thursday, you just listened, as I'll repeat now. There are teams that have the capability to do things they just haven't done. Sometimes they choose not to do them. Sometimes, for whatever reason, they have misfired execution-wise. But that never means in a one-game scenario it couldn't happen. Texas A&M did some stuff against LSU yesterday. We hadn't seen them do all year. But it turns out they were capable of it. J.J. McCarthy, 12 of 24, 263. A lot of the, a lot of, I guess, the correlating stat lines outside of those explosive plays look very ordinary. But here's the thing, that doesn't matter because the explosive plays count just as much as the gain for no yards on second and two. And the explosive plays change the game. So Michigan, I, I so vividly remember looking at the box score, the live box score, as we're approaching the half, and they've got a 17-13 lead near the half, and they were averaging 0.1 yards per carry. If you're Ohio State, do you not have to be ecstatic about that? Because what you set out to do is exactly what's happening. You're stoning them at the line of scrimmage. Now, it turned out that that wasn't going to last. But Ryan Day even said in his postgame, we felt like we fought in the first half. We liked where we had them in the first half. And yet there's Michigan. 17-13 lead. I think Ohio State led by three at the break. But the most stunning thing, as I said, for me to watch is not Michigan popping one big play or popping maybe one more big play. It's the total lack of any kind of adjustment. I'm not saying adjustments weren't made in theory. I'm saying on the whole, I'm saying overarching game philosophy, there was really no defensive adjustment made. And Michigan took advantage of it. It was lethal the way they took advantage of it. Recruiting matters, okay? Scheme matters and cohesion matters, but J.J. McCarthy is an elite quarterback playing back there. Donovan Edwards, when they did start to break big runs, that's an elite running back. I remember sitting, I remember a lot of things on the show so far. I remember sitting there on our signing day show when that kid's incoming as a true freshman and they're fighting Ohio State and Notre Dame and they get him and we spent like 20 minutes talking about Donovan Edwards. And you know what my DMs looked like afterwards? A disaster. We got criticized. I got criticized for talking about Donovan Edwards too much. Well, hey, Corum couldn't go yesterday. Edwards had one hand. Donovan Edwards might as well have been like a pirate, you know, with like a little hook on his other hand. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Because he had two feet. They worked just fine. And he could have run to Toledo, Ohio, if they didn't build that end zone where he physically couldn't go any further. Because when he got loose, man, he really got loose. They never 
adjusted. They never took it away. And to Michigan's credit, they kept taking and taking and taking. There's, the, there's a misconception, I think, about this team, this Michigan program, because you can go so many directions with this. I don't need to read you the box score. You know what the box score says. You know what your eyes saw yesterday. You know about the big plays through the air. You know about the big plays on the ground. You know that when Ohio State looked like they had answered and they pulled to within one possession, it lasted one play. Michigan rips another one off, and brother, that sideline exploded when that happened. I was over there. And here's the thing about Michigan, or here's a thing about Michigan. What do you think? I'll, I'll ask you before I give you my take on this. What do you think when I just say Michigan football? Is it something that's changing, or do you have a pretty set opinion on them? But I'm asking you, think in your mind. You may be watching live or watching the replay or listening to the podcast. What do you think when I say Michigan football? Because I think there's a little misconception out there because of the way they carry themselves. Confidence is not always as it seems. Let me put it that way. A lot of the attributes that you associate with confidence actually don't correlate with confidence at all. A lot of people think a confident person is really brash and really in your face and they call themselves alphas like four or five times per hour. That's not what real confidence is. Confidence is Michigan. Confidence is Jim Harbaugh. Michigan is the most confident program in the Big Ten. Harbaugh is the most confident coach in the Big Ten. It's not because they run their mouth. They rarely do. It's not because they're very demonstrative pregame. I stood there and watched them warming up yesterday. I don't think I heard many of their players say a word. That's not what confidence is. Confidence is being totally comfortable and resolute in whatever your philosophy is. And if you think about Jim Harbaugh, that's him to a T. That dude listened for years to people, honestly, like me, look at him and say, I don't think this offense is going to work in modern college football. Look at all these other programs around you. Look at the quarterbacks they have. Look at the perimeter skill talent they have. How will you ever keep up with them? He never changed. There's a fine line between cerebral and stubborn, between confidence and just stupidity. He's on the right side of it, though. Michigan's on the right side of it. They never flinched. That's what confidence is. That program never flinched, and not just yesterday, and not just last year. They never flinched even when things weren't necessarily going their way. And even when there was warranted criticism because the results weren't what they should be. They are so confident because their process is so proven that he can afford to try and get the Vikings job, fail, lose both of his coordinators, have to totally check back in, replace them, chose to go a different direction at quarterback, chose to go with J.J. McCarthy over Cade McNamara, and the net result is his team's better this year than it was last year, and I've thought that the entire season. They just validated it yesterday. That's confidence. Confidence isn't how many bands you put on your arm. It's not what you draw an eye black on your face. It's being able to carry yourself and not flinching because you know your way is the way. Michigan's way is the way. That's the best team in the Big Ten right now. Here's the thing about the program. The program is now proving itself potentially as the best program in the Big Ten. And I am very, very slow to ever say things like that because I got immense amounts of respect for Ohio State. One outcome in a game rarely drastically tilts my opinion of that. So I, it's not like I'm vastly downgrading Ohio State here. I'm going to talk about them in just a second. I just think the world of what Michigan's doing, and I think that their talent level's kind of crept up on folks. I think that folks look at McCarthy, maybe up until yesterday, and you thought of him as just another Michigan quarterback. Now, people who follow recruiting, you know that's a different skill level. He possesses a different skill level. But most people don't follow it that hardcore. So you just look at McCarthy and think, hey, he's, another, he's another Michigan quarterback. No, he's not. He's the best they've had up there. He's the best Harbaugh has had during his tenure there. Dom and Edwards, likewise, in the backfield. They're playing without their top player yesterday, guys. And they still hang 45. They had so many points. When I was in the media scrum post game, half the folks didn't even realize they had topped 40. They thought 38 was the number. Michigan just kind of tacked on another touchdown. Why? Because they could. Why not rip off another 80-plus yard touchdown? Ohio State had the entire table set yesterday. We talk about the winners first here. 
And I just talked about Michigan, and I'll talk about them again later in the week. But there's also a downside to this. There's also a loser in the equation, and the loser yesterday in emphatic fashion was Ohio State. And what hurts, aside from losing the game, is what it comes on the heels of. Last year, we were in Ann Arbor for that game. The whole world watched this game last year. But the thing about it is, if you wanted to, really, if you, if you admit it to yourself, you could make excuses for Ohio State last year if you wanted to. You could tell yourself the team was banged up. I think they were sick. You know, hoops amongst us hasn't had that happen. But it was snowing. I can assure you it was miserable up there. And I know what the counter is. You don't have to tell me both teams played in it. I know that. My point is, if you're trying to play devil's advocate, and you're trying to make excuses for a team and admit that you're doing that, yes, you could just say, all right, blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then, broken clocks right twice a day, and Michigan was eventually going to get Ohio State. It was just the perfect confluence of events last year. Whatever last year was in the favor of Michigan, it all was inverted this time around. The, the entire table was set for Ohio State yesterday. Forecast looked gross seven days ago. It ends up being 55 and sunny. I wore short sleeves for a majority of this afternoon. You had a big recruiting weekend on tap. Uh, Jim Knowles, you got the defensive replacement that you needed last year. So theoretically, those big plays weren't going to bite you like they did last year. You certainly had the revenge angle to sell your kids. You got home field. Michigan is limited offensively this year, plus their best player, as it turns out, is out of the game after a couple of plays, and you get drug anyway. You get pantsed anyway. Just embarrassed. Just drug. And that's kind of stunning, and that makes you do some soul searching. And the thing about it, when that happens, is it's so demoralizing, you don't have an immediate answer. Everybody wants to know one thing. What's the one thing? Well, there was no one thing. There is no one thing that contributes to something like that. It's a collection of a number of things. And you're not immediately ready to admit it afterwards. And Ryan Day was not immediately ready. He was not argumentative. He was, in fact, very defeated and very somber, as any of us would be in that position, in his post-game yesterday. But I don't know who asked the question, although there were two feet in front of me. But someone started to ask him about Jim Knowles, defensive coordinator. And... Sometimes someone's asking such a good question, you can see the body language from the coach. Mid-question, they realize, oh man, this guy's right. And when Ryan Day was getting asked, I'm going to paraphrase the question, but the question was something like, you got victimized by big plays last year, so you went and got Jim Knowles to bring him in to rectify that, and yet big plays killed you today even more than they did last year. What's your response to that? Midway through that question, he kind of goes, wow. And he, he slumps his shoulders and he looks down and he just starts to shake his head. And he realized, yes, right. I sure did. And he's right. They sure did bite us today every bit as much. And he gave a pretty standard answer. You know, you got to reassess. You got to watch the film. I know he's got to make changes. He knows he has to make changes. Now, that's the easy part to say. What are the changes? What are the changes? Does he look internally? Does he look at himself? Does he regret not going for it when the entire stadium and, and his quarterback, namely, is on the field asking third and five, third and six, let's go, or four, fourth and five, fourth and six, let's go for it. Does he, does he regret that? Uh, does he regret you know, several other things from a play calling perspective? Does he regret any of the hires? Does he think strength and conditioning needs to be overhauled? All of these things are holistically normally given as the reason why someone lost. It could be 10% of 10 different things need to be overhauled. Uh, this is a very, very good program. So this is not a treasure or trash situation as it's normally made out to be. Ryan Day, it's not treasure versus trash. Uh, the reality is about 98% of the sport is somewhere between treasure and trash. And Ryan Day is between treasure and trash. A lot closer to treasure than he is trash. The Ohio State program right now, somewhere between it. A lot closer to treasure than they are trash. There was talk last night, mind you, not by serious people, but there was talk last night that we got to get him out of here. I normally don't even entertain this foolishness, but it was so widespread, I feel like I need to at least entertain it if to do nothing more than bat it down. Uh, Ryan Day is one of the best head coaches in America. 
Ohio State's one of the best programs in America. They got soundly beaten yesterday by also one of the best head coaches in America and also one of the best programs in America. I'm going to say a sentence here, but you won't believe it. It happens sometimes. Now, Ohio State fans should never accept that. That coaching staff should never accept that, nor will they. What I'm saying is uh, you can go ahead and lose it to him again next year. Fire him if you want to. And I, don't, I was listening to Tom Fornelli talk about this, and I don't, I don't think he's wrong. I think there would be a big push to get rid of Ryan Day next year if he were to lose to Michigan. Um, I'm not even going to call your expectation level warped because the bottom line is you are one of two great whites in your conference. You played the other one yesterday. Outside of that, you should soundly beat everybody that you play. And so it really doesn't matter if you win 10 games or 11 games at Ohio State. If you lose that one at the end of the year, it normally means you're not going to go play for the Big Ten. Therefore, you're not going to go play for the national championship, and you go 0 for 3 on your goals. And this is the second year in a row now that Ohio State's going to go 0 for 3. And Colin's got a second piece of audio that I want to play for you in just a second. But to tee it up, some people were taken aback nationally, I think, outside of the fan bases here, a lot of people were taken by surprise that there was such a strong and swift reaction, this anti-Ryan Day reaction. Like, if you guys have not trafficked in it, I'm not lying to you when I say there is a, there is a, a non-zero chunk, like a sizable chunk of the Ohio State fan base that wants action taken against the head coach of the program here. And if not the head coach, they want sweeping changes made in the program. And you were taken aback by that for the reasons that I spoke about last week, people simply had not allowed their mind to go there because everybody associated with that program thought they were going to beat Michigan comfortably yesterday. A big swath of the nation thought that Ohio State was going to beat Michigan comfortably. Therefore, they had not allowed their mind to fathom what it would be like if Ohio State lost. But on this show, I had already gone there. And so it shouldn't have been a surprise, Colin, get it ready, when this happened. Do you understand how catastrophic that would be for Ryan Day? Do you understand how catastrophic that would be? How big a failure that would be for Ohio State football to have had that collection of talent and two years in a row be in a position to achieve all your goals and have it wrecked by a Michigan team that at one point you were dominating and you got C.J. Stroud at quarterback and you're not even going to play for the Big Ten Championship with him again. You got a guy like Marvin Harrison having, in my mind's eye, a Bolitnikoff award-winning season right there with Jalen Hyatt, and you're not even going to play for the Big Ten Championship with him. Can you imagine those folks if they lose that game? So there's pressure. There's always pressure. But, man, there's a different kind of pressure on Ohio State in this game. That was the way it was always going to be. It's totally over the cliff. It is burn it to the ground and start over from scratch. And that in reality is not the answer, but I'm not surprised that that's the reaction. They had no answers yesterday. So now I do want to suggest one thing because everyone wants to talk about Michigan and could they win a national championship? I got a really short answer for you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who makes the playoff this year can win the national championship. And the reason I'm kind of reserving my take on Michigan moving forward is because I'm going to talk about it a lot this week. Like, it's, it's incredible what Jim Harbaugh is doing. With Ohio State, I will tell you one thing. i got to be careful with my words here because it's going to sound like I'm trying to be a hater of C.J. Stroud. I'm not. I'm not a C.J. Stroud hater at all. I'm going to speak generically. It's just that watching this game kind of triggered this for me. One thing in one direction that I think Ryan Day will go, and he should go. And one direction that I think not only Ryan Day will go, but every leader of an elite program should go, is there is no excuse in 2022 and beyond why you don't have mobility at quarterback. The quarterback position has evolved so much over the last decade to 15 years. Lamar Jackson has been huge in this push. It used to be that if you wanted a runner at quarterback, you had to sacrifice arm talent to get it. He was going to be a runner, and he could throw, but boy, you were really going to have to scheme guys open because he's not going to be a precision passer. That's not the case anymore. There is a generation of kids now who are average to plus throwers of the football, 
And you could even describe them as pass first guys. Excellent in the pocket, but they can make plays with their legs. And here's the most important part, they're willing to. CJ Stroud possesses exactly half of that package. CJ Stroud's a phenomenal quarterback. He does not do what Bryce Young does for Alabama. He does not possess the ability to keep the defense up the night before they play him because they know if all else fails, that guy's going to kill us with his legs. You've got to have it. It's not a novelty concept anymore. In modern college football, if you are an elite recruiting program, you should never settle for just having a pocket passer on your team. Never settle for it. Do you understand how big a weapon, how big a game changer it is? Look at J.J. McCarthy. J.J. McCarthy's not a track guy. J.J. McCarthy's not afraid to run the ball. I think he had about 30 total rushing yards yesterday. He transformed the football game because his ability to stick his face in the fan, or he's willing to stick his face in the fan, he can run the ball. He's willing to run the ball. And Dylan Rayola, for example, is a quarterback committed to them. I think he fits this category. And I think that they will have this taken care of in the future, but they haven't had it this year. And the reality is it wasn't going to bite them until this game either way, but it bit them yesterday. 31 of 48 for 349 is a huge stat line. It wasn't good enough. And it wasn't good enough in the end because Ohio State, they needed not just to get to the red zone, they needed to punch it in. And boy, that mobility at quarterback matters. And it matters when you don't have it too. So that's one little answer there. That's not your, your cure-all, but that is one answer. There's a lot that's going to be made out of this this week and in the coming weeks because Ohio State season is done, I think. And, well, let me put a pause on that. I don't know if their season's done. But I know whatever happens in the future is going to ring kind of hollow for them at least the rest of this year because of what happened yesterday. Guys, thanks for watching Late Kick. Make sure to leave a comment. I love interacting with you. But most of all, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. That's how we keep all of this free.